For Hate's Sake by Gav Thrope For many there seems to be little difference between hate and anger, but they are opposites. Anger is quick, hot, explosive in its intensity. Hate is slow, cold, continually eroding that which it touches. Occasionally hate becomes anger, a short burst of externalized power, but the expulsion of that energy does not lessen the intensity of the emotion. Hate is most efficient when honed and directed, continually whetted by the psyche into a sharp instrument, concentrated and focused like a laser. Brother Hirkason, or Laki, recalled the lesson from his days as an initiate as he watched the cutter hiss through the rusted metal of the access door bolts. The blue laser reflected green from the ochre armor of the Imperial Fist and his companions. The only light in the narrow passage. He glanced back, acutely aware of the noise from the cutter's generator, even though Sergeant Tankard and his squad guarded the approach from a level above. Latest reports had the enemy at the last two hundred meters away, but a scouting party or new patrol with the auspex might pick up any one of a number of betraying signals emanating from the Imperial Fist breaching party. In the gloom of the hive bottom, heat and vibration would announce their presence long before any visual sighting. Nearly through, said Garo, the tech marine, a silver arm that extended his expended backpack swiveled down into the fuel valve of the cutter and adjusted it slightly. Two to go. Or Loki, said Sergeant Vilk, grabbing one of the wheel locks. Legionary grabbed the other wheel, ensuring the heavy door would not fall. Even with his armor running on silent power, he was more than strong enough to take the weight. Done. Gerald turned off the cutter and stood, quietly transferring his weight as he stepped back. Or Loki saw, Vilk gave him a nod, and between the two of them they lowered the door to one side. Away from the route, though to the next chamber. Armor sponsors passed on the cool breeze that emanated from the laser space beyond. The tech marine switched on his suit lamp, the yellow beam playing over the hulking machine in the store bay they had uncovered. Three massive drill heads, recessed melter muzzles, nestled at the front, below and to the left of the door clustered in front of a heavy cabled box that Orlaki took to be seismic generators. Once operational, the drill would burrow through ten meters of rock a second. The Imperial Fist would no longer be trapped between the Sons of Horus above and below. The war would turn in their favor. There would be a great deal of anger released then, much noise and violence. Until then, Orlaki moved in quiet, silence, part of his hate along with the cold and the dark. To the last man, to the last blood, to the last breath. Simple words that expoxidated the lifetime of service to death. Kezio, Drag, reached out his to his armor on the stand, thick fingers gripping the parchment of the seal. With a quick jerk, he ripped the red wax oath seal from the ceramite. Paint came with it, revealing a flash of white beneath the grey white of the pauldron. It had been on his first oath of moment, after becoming a son of Horus, swearing allegiance to the Legion, its new guise. The symbol of the lunar wolves had just been beneath the surface all the time. The Thrag had never set foot on Luna. He was a son of Carthonia, like his war master. He reached for another seal, knowing by heart the words inked into the parchment. His affirmation before the attack on 6319. He knew others of the Tenth Company that long since discarded theirs. The oath later profaned by the actions of the traitor Loken. Drag didn't care much for such thoughts. His oath was his own, unsullied by the weakness of others. A third seal followed for the Oregus Reclamation, an award rather than an oath marked within Aquila of the Emperor himself. 
before David. Before 6319. A year before Ulanor, even. Thrag sneered as he ripped it away. How blind they had been. As the creator had intended. Lied to. Disdained. To be dead and discarded on the altars of lesser mortals. But Horus had shown them the truth. A truth that had been ratified when the bastards of Dawn had tried to claim Carthonia as their own. But Thrag, and others like him, would never bend the knee to an outsider. And the resistance had paid off, with the arrival of Captain Oshkadon's companies, and thus usurpers had already been driven from the upper hive into the warrens of the ancient ages that were the hunting grounds of Thrag and his ilk. His people had not been born here in Luprakal's gate, but his father had led them to the promise of service to the ascendant king, battling across the territories of a dozen other gangs and tribes. Adgax had died in sight of his de destination, killed by his own brother, and Drag had avenged him just moments later. Now the oldest oath came to mind, as then, the words that he had sworn over his father's corpse. The same he had heard spoken to him since he was born. More than an oath, a way of life, a way of death. Just as the lunar wolf's heraldry lay beneath the veneer of the sons of Horus, so Drag's skin masked something deeper, his armor stripped of its imperial fancy. Now it was time to renew the connection of flesh to world, of warrior to king. He drew his combat blade down across the brow and cheek on the left his face, scoring a straight line. His blood thickened on the blade and congealed in the wound immediately. It was enough to leave a scar, as it had done the first time, for his body had been remade. To the last man, he cut another mark parallel to the first. To the last blood. The third was diagonal from the bridge of the nose to the turn of the jaw. Thick droplets slid from the knife to the last breath. Footsteps had Drag turned towards the door. It was Tormak, the sergeant. More of armored fronds lurked in the gloom beyond, though he was not their leader. The others respected Drag as their most senior, and even Tormak deferred to him on some occasions. Drag had never been drawn to command, not even of a squad, but in the narrow way. His experience was greater than that of any many captain. Played on, said Tormak. We're from Urshkadon. The usurpers are in the third vault deeps. So? said Drag, mentioning to one of the arming servitors loitering in the shadows. It juttered in the view and took up the first piece of war plate to be affixed to the legionary. They overextended themselves. Maybe they've located a seismic drilling station. The captain wants it for our side. The dried blood caking side of Drag's face cracked, flaked as his cheeks turned into a broad smile. Keep them away from the drillhead! Warlocky well, didn't need the command from Lieutenant Viermoth to understand the situation. The goal of the Sons of Horus had been obvious from the moment their first troops had thrust straight towards the rig control cabin. Heavy weapons fire was directed at the parts of the chamber away from the drill rig. Clearly, they wanted it for themselves. He assumed the clarification had been for the Cthonian recruits, thirteen of them stationed to the left and right of the main rig. The yellow paint of their armor barely weeks old, having been applied during a hasty introduction ceremony by Captain Geddes, even as the newly arrived sons of Horus forces had broken into the upper hive. They were raw as full legionaries, but they were far from strangers to battle. Having proven themselves as scouts for the legion, their tunnel-fighting instincts, every bit as sharp as the sons of Horus, they had stalked and evaded for the past seven years. Along with Sarge and Tankard's squad, Orlaki and the rest of Vox, warriors fired down at the traitors from a vantage point just in front of the main engine block. The first wave of the Sons of Horus showed little regard for tactics, pouring through the broad main doors into the maintenance bay with a welter of constant but inaccurate fire. 
Their armor was mismatched, some of it painted black cinnamite, other pieces decades old, the heavy-duty bombing studs, and feature the earliest actions of the Great Crusade. Museum pieces. <laughs> Probably literally. They move clumsily in their haphazard war plates, and not just because their suit systems were poorly synced. Orlaki had killed a few at close quarters, before the sheen that they were physically inferior to full legionaries. The Sons of Horus facilities had been limited, and their practice short, and these poorly formed warriors were evidence of both. He fired two more shots and threw a knot of a grey-clad warrior, pushing towards Lieutenant Vilmoff on the left. Across Orlaki's line of fire, he ejected the empty magazine and reached for another. Though the Imperial Fist faced many issues, for the moment, supplies were not numbered among them. They emptied the armories as best as they could before retreating, setting up caches deep inside the Undercity, where even the Sons of Horus could not find them. During his brief succession of fire, Orlaki heard the whir of powered wretchets, the binaric chants of Geral, just a couple of meters behind him, as a tech marine worked to get the old machine into action again. Occasionally his ma's tongue was broken by recognizable words, though gothic, invective. These seemed to accompany an increase in the tempo and volume of the hummering. In the piloting cabin, just ahead to the left, two tech edips were working on the frozen control systems, with as much progress as Gero, judging by their frequent stops and hectic gestures of multiple limbs, both human and mechanical. With fresh ammunition loaded, Horlaki opened fire again, sending a trio of bolts into the faceplate of a traitor, almost at the bottom of the ramp, that had led to the maintenance dock. Cedamite split, and the renegade fell back, blood gouting from the fractured helm. A sudden concussive wave boomed from the vicinity of the main doors, and a single volley of bolts slammed into the rig, concentrated on the cabin. One tech adept fell sideways out of the open door, half of her head missing, the other turned just a second volley erupted from the new wave of the attackers. This too was focused on the cab, explosions shredding the interior of the tech adept within. At the door were ten fully armored sons of Horus. Orlaki knew enough to recognize their campaign markings immediately among the traitor slogans and other vile iconography. Crusade veterans, merciless and efficient. Orlaki opened fire and voiced a new choice of words, of invective too. The pilot cab now turned into ribbons and splinters. Gazil, Drag, and the rest of Tormac's squad turned their guns on the Imperial Fist guarding the ramp that ran along the flank of the dormant rig. They fired over the heads of the Nulvuk that battled hand to hand with Dawn's sons near the foot of the ramp, targeting the Emperor's servants firing down into the melee from the safety of the boarding platform. The newly engineered sons of Horus were a useful distraction, but Drag considered them good for little else, forced to compromise their stragnics genetic testing, and the speed in which legionary enhancements had been implanted. The embattled sons of Horus had allowed impurities to enter the gene enhancement regimen. The gene seed was still pure, but the implanted teas were not. The bowels of the Carthonia held many toxic and radioactive elements that corroded the availability of recruits, and now those in perfectly screened faults were coming to the fore. Most of the Nulvok were fit enough for the job, but some had less mass than proper. Others had not quite the same height and senses and reflexes. Defenses. Uh, defects normally weeded out during the scrupulous physical and combat test. It was totally unlike the grueling years of enhancement and training that Drag had undergone only a few kilometers above this forgotten place. These days, the war against the Imperial Fist was the test. Others were worse. Carved in spine and lip or suffering malgrowths of muscle tissue, but still able to fit into their scrap plate armor. Like those ahead of Drag, they made useful shock troops and bolter fodder, the infirmities rendering them unable to operate as part of a coordinated firing team. Nobody really wanted to command them, so the Nuvok were treated as temporary auxiliaries, passed from company to company as needed or not. Most didn't survive or stay in one place long enough to have markings on their 
painted lavery, save for the Eye of Horus that united all the defenders of Carthunia. While Tormac's veterans kept up the punishing barrage of fire, other sons of Horus' squad pushed into the maintenance station, breaking to the one side of the immense drilling machine. A despoiler-heavy weapon squad led by Sergeant Kandak could now target the Imperial Fist and atop and are crowned the drill's engine housing, forcing them back towards the dark recess of the hall with their opening salvo. With their own support reduced, the Imperial Fist holding the docking ramp drove and with a renewed push by the new Volk. Tormak signaled the advance, but just at the moment an Imperial Fist reappeared at the top of the drill engine, Bolter leveled. In the gloom, Thrag thought he saw a spider painted in black upon the vimbrance of the split second, or a flare of bolt purple in it snared his attention. He turned away from the shot, but too late. The explosive projectile hitting the side of his helm, prominent muzzle, ceramite, and glassite exploded into his eye as he reeled from the impact, sending daggers of pain through his face. It was only a couple of seconds before he recovered from the shock, but in the time it took to swing his bolter up to reply in kind, the Imperial Fist was gone. Olaki found himself crouched in the darkness of the access passage again, but this time it was amid a fury of flickering bolts and the crack of detonations. A flurry of impact shattered the breastplate of Kiliox, his battle brother collapsed with a grunt of pain next to him, but he kept his focus on the sons of Horus trying to push out from the drill station. Hold! bellowed Lieutenant Virmath as a ball plasma spat from his pistol, lighting the corridor and armored corpses as it flashed to the doorway. Its detonation sent a traitor initiate flying back, pieces of molten sedimite spraying across his companions. Verlaki knew what was at stake. If they gave up this foothold next to the drill station, he would lose any chance of retaking the boring engine. He picked his shots, desperate, despite the bolt rounds, cracking past and throwing shrapnel from the wall beside him. He was a soldier of the Emperor, an instrument of humanity's will, and he would do his duty, whatever it took. His next shot hit the faceplate of his target, breaking open the boar-like snout, shattering the jaw within. The Sons of Horus returned fire, and bolt rounds cracked across the Epilophis plastium and pauldrons. But Olaki's aim did not waver. A second shot hit the ruined helm again, punching through flesh and shared the spine and brain. Headless, the armored body fell, its crash lost among the others, din in the din of war. It had been some time since they had last heard from Terra. He had to believe that the loyalists still held on or perhaps even that the Emperor had destroyed Horus' forces already. As surely, he would. He did not consider this in the hope of relieving, arriving, but simply to acknowledge that he was part of something far vaster than the battle for a drilling machine. The lieutenant's explorations were not a call for the here and now, but an echo of a command that rang out across the whole galaxy. Hold the traitors at every turn, and grant them no easy advance. Every dead renegade was a victory of its own. Olaki could only imagine the vast wars raging in the soul system, and beyond. As far removed from this firefight as it was, the game skirmishes on Necromundan Underhive that had been his first taste of bloodshed. And yet every war was nothing more than the conflicts of its constant fighters. He had been trained to operate as part of a squad, which was alongside other squads as a company, arranged in the order of a legion itself, one part of the forces of the Imperium and the Emperor. It did not feel like a battle to defend the soil of the throne world. Yet he was part of the same struggle. Firing again, the movable as the Sons of Horus counterattack faltered, when Loki felt the whole weight of the Imperial Fist leaning on him. Not as a burden, but as support, holding him in place in line of tens of thousands long, and behind them the hand of the Emperor himself to keep them in place. They were not only by the creation of the Emperor and his alchemized genius, they were even the embodiment of an immortal, indomitable will. Whether on an airless moon, a boarding ship, or in the void, 
holding a dark corridor in the depths below an artificial mountain. Wherever a space marine of the Emperor stood and fought, the Empress too stood and fought. Grunting heavily, Thrag punched into the mask of the fallen pillar of fist again, turning the broken ceramite into a bloody mess. Blow after blow, pulverizing the face beyond recognition. His victims still living companions withdrew. Their latest attack, blunted by the ferocity of the veterans. Immediate counterattack. Thrag stood, releasing his grip on the gorget of the dead foe. Someone shouted his name. Thrad standing beside the cabin between the two yellow-armored corpses. This one! Thrag turned so he could see with a good eye. Tormak had given him leave to withdraw for a bionic fitting, but Thrag had declined. His place was here in the fight. Thrard held up the arm of one of the Imperial Fists, displaying a spider mark on the Vembrace. Wrong arm! The spider had long legs, said Thrag shaking his head. Thread let the limb drop and kicked the body down the steps of the cab, clearing the way for the engine seers that had been brought in to revive the drill machine. They had to pick their way across armored corpses and fallen masonry. The station bore the scars of the fighting as badly as the bodies of the combatants. Inside the cab, one of the adepts resumed their coaxing of the drill dormant machine's brain and reluctant data systems. Another resumed work on the engines, consuming the task that had been started by the Imperial Fist, the Tech Marine. Do you think they'll give up yet? said Thrard, jumping across the hulk, housing the which Thrag examined the newly fallen Imperial Fist. There were no few sons of Horus among them. Two of them fellow veterans, but he felt nothing as his eye passed over the lifeless war plate. It's a third attack in nine hours. They're not giving up until they're dead, but we are, replied Thrag. He made it known he wanted to be the one to take out the Imperial Fists who had taken his eye, if possible. He'd been wounded before, but there had been something... conspicuous about that parting shot that roused Drag's ire. If he could, he would teach the upstart son of Dorn what it was to be a legionary, and that it had limits to the pain it could withstand. The crack of bolt rounds announced the Imperial Fist, intent not to wait any longer. A squad with breaching shields appearing at the doorway behind the drill. Not giving up, growled Drag, leveling his bolt but holding fire. There's no point wasting ammunition on the powered shields. For the war master! A shout was raised by the Nulvok as they charged the newcomers, hitting the shield wall with the same result as if they had thrown themselves at the solid Firocrate. Imperial Fist held them and then surged back, forcing an opening around the doorway. Over the bodies of half a dozen Nulvok, their bolt of fire like pikes of a phalanx of ancient days, slaying all that tried to stand before them. The call of Horus, Imperial title, at once set Thrag's heart beating faster, bursting with pride at being recognized as one of his sons, named in the Legion itself. But the War Master had been there. If King Luprakau had at that moment appeared and told him to hurl himself at the Imperial Fist, Thrag would gladly have done so. But Horus was light years away, battling the Emperor on terror. In his absence, Thrag had felt his loyalty growing smaller. Not weaker, just contained to this place, his home, to the warriors at his side. Now, even that was not much to regard. Tainted by the humiliation heaped on Cathonia by the Imperial Fist occupation. Among the Imperial Fist that advanced in the wake of the breaching squad, he saw a familiar spider mark. Now, his heart started beating faster. Now there was something worth rousing himself for. Die, you rat bastard sons! He roared, charging alone in the drill's track housing, bolter firing. The veterans followed him unthinkingly, 
attacking even as a new folk were falling back, catching the impaled fists as they established their maneuver. Drag leapt down to the fetal crate floor, lowered a shoulder and bull charged the closest foe, slamming his shield aside as fawns of power squirreled across the Sons of Horus' armor. Thrad was a step behind, his bolter turning a plasteron of the shield carrier to shattered ochre and crimson. Tormak jumped past a second later, exploiting the gap, his power sword slashing the arm from another breaching squad warrior. The second line of Imperial Fist opened fire, but Thrag ran into the storm of bolters, giving them no time for a second fusillade. He was fixed on the Son of Dawn with a spider on his arm, and the others knew it, depending upon this to work out in their favors with their own axes of attack. The Imperial Fist reacted slowly to the break in their protective line, giving Drag the chance he needed. He fired Port Blank into the torso of the Imperial Fist, using his bolts as a distraction while he pulled out his combat knife. The Imperial Fist saw the threat and opened fire in return. Exploding warheads filled the narrowing space between them as the fire and ceramic shrapnel. At the last moment, the Imperial Fist lunged, smashing his muzzle of his bolter upwards into the damaged side of Drag's helm. His knife missed its mark by a centimeter, plunging down into the clavicle rather than the artery of his foe's throat. The Imperial Fist neighbor clubbed Drag backwards with his bolter, blood fountaining from the knife wound as he pulled his weapon free. The moment passed. The boarding squad reformed as Drag was battered off the door platform half a dozen meters to the drill station floor. He landed heavily, opening fire as soon as he could. The Imperial Fist had started to withdraw, and his tacker was out of his sight a couple seconds later. Back aching, face again throbbing with pain, Dreg let his hand drop to his side, Bolter still in his grip. Next time, he called out, knowing his foe would survive the wound he dealt. His voice dropped to a whisper. Next time. The standard Vox channels were all compromised on both sides, so Lieutenant Vermoff's conversation with Captain Geddes took place on a bulky Vox coder set that was thus audible to everyone in the strike force, gathered in the chamber just twenty meters from the drill station. No, Captain. They hold both the north and east entrances. We have the south, but only just. Another counterattack seems inevitable at this stage. Olaki stood, watch at the top down, into the access tunnel. But there was no movement from the Sons of Horus. Why would there be? They held the drill, and the continuing sounds of reactivation were obvious. It was just a matter of time before they succeeded, and the Imperial Fist would have failed. If I had legionaries to spare, Vermoff, I would not need the drill. The commander of the Imperial Fist reply crackled across the airwaves, distorted by encryption patterns. We are losing mobility as we descend, and enemy numbers are having greater and greater effect. Understood, Captain, said Vermoff. He motioned for Tagera to switch off the set, and then stood up, turning to face the rest of his much-diminished command. We have one last effort, one last chance to achieve something glorious for the Legion, he said. There was a tone in his voice that betrayed the hollowness of the sentiment. This was not like Olaki's first battle, as a full legionary. When he had crossed the fields of Kondori beneath a gold-threaded standard, the massed guns of the company driving the enemy before them, this battle was akin to the squilled skirmishes and the knife fights of his youth. A series of swift yet brutal exchanges. There was no glory here, he realized and he suspected neither was there for a place of honor. This was a tunnel fight, a battle. Thinking of his days in the Unhive brought something to mind. I have an idea, Lieutenant, he said, gesturing for Kordanik to take his place at the hitch. The two legionaries swapped positions. This is a heist, not a battle. Vermaff looked at him for a couple seconds, and it was obvious the Terran-born officer did not understand. All we need is the drill, explained Olaki. We need to wait until the traders have it working, and then we seize it. 
The drill is how we get out of here. And if we fail, we let them have the drill when it's fully operational? It's fair. It's true. Whatever we try, Lieutenant. Grimoff conceded the point and with a nod. I concur, but the sons of Horus will have give everything to stop us. They have the advantage of position and defense. They know where we are coming from and what we are trying to siege. We need to draw them out, away from the rig. Vimaf went on to order two-thirds of the force to stand ready to attack the eastern access gate, but this was to be a diversion for the attack. Through the nearby north across, it was risky, sending the greater strength of the Imperial Fist away, but anything less would be spotted as a ruse. Fortunately, the station structure and the activated boring machine would block auspexes on both sides. So the part of the force remaining in place would be hard to detect, even as they made their move. With the Vox out of the operation, Veermouth would lead the second team, deciding when to strike, 60 seconds after their attack had started. A full assault that would force the Sons of Horus to mass against them. The heist squad was to make straight for the control cabin to commandeer the V-drill. Orlaki watched the other squads quietly leaving. If the Sons of Horus had the slightest idea what was happening, they would sweep away the remaining fourteen legionaries without too much issue and come on the other force behind them. There was nothing to be done except wait until the first shots were fired. Once again, the darkness and silence were their best allies. The seconds became minutes, and minutes became an hour. Ulaki and the others were still as statues. Only the warplate senses active to minimize heat and signal desperation. Ulaki noticed a rat crawl across his foot. It was easily half a meter long in body, its fur crackling with static discharge from the legionary's power pack. Warty growths pocked the rodent's back and flanks. One eye a milky white as it scurried down the corridor, oblivious to the statue-like imperial fist. So it seemed for the sons of Horus. As a chronometer passed the 94-minute mark, the stillness broke with petrochemical cough, ancient engines reverberating from below stuttering for a few seconds before becoming a throatier constant snarl. Ronaki flexed a fraction, bringing his armor's mobility functions back to imminent potential. Readings, all green, faded in from his visor view. Behind him, a sigh of activators betrayed the small movements of the others. Wait, said Sergeant Volk. The whisper from his external address, no louder than the distant hiss of the fans in the background, thrum atmospheric cylinders. Several more seconds passed, and the massive engine continued its growl. Success with the engine did not signify control, though it would be up to Lieutenant Vienmoff to decide whether the drill was ready or not. Another minute passed, and the tone of the engine changed to a higher pitch, as someone increased the revelations. Bonaki felt rather than saw or heard his squad brothers tensing. It seemed likely that the engine speed was being altered from the cabin. The crack of bolters, vague with a distance, followed just under ten seconds later. Wait! Bullock reminded them as armor creaked in the blackness. The louder, deeper detonation of grenades and the rapid thunder of auto cannon firing. That would be Forsak. Orlaki. He imagined silvery gray ceramite shattering under the impact of high caliber rapid fire rounds. Go! Volk was on his feet and jumping down the hatch a split second later, thrusting into the alertness of his squad. Lech followed, and then Orlaki, thrusting into the shrapnel's pitted fiddlecrate, following with a long strides along the passage, and through the station's upper axis. Volk opened fire, plasma chewing through the chestplate of Sons of Horus Neodophate, just a few meters inside the portal. 
one of the three that was still keeping watch, but distracted by the firefight raging on the other side of the drill. The second and third turned, taken totally unawares. The combined volley of the arriving Imperial fists cracking upon at Havoc Warplate, sending them thrumbling back down across the ramp. Volk and Lok set up a fire point, while Olaki and Dengarin continued down the ramp towards the drill cab. Standard doctrine was to hold position at five meter intervals, so that in pairs the squad would close in on their objective. Several sons of Horus had already turned back from the squads pushing out towards a diversionary attack, alerted to the threat at the north entrance. Unlucky felt a twitch in his injured shoulder as he saw a son of Horus veteran with a steel plate eye patch leaping up towards him. The one that had come from before with single-minded murderous intent. Others followed behind, heading to cut off the Imperial Fist approach to the rig. Objective priority secure, barked Olaki, ordering his sergeant's command. Suppression! He sprinted down the ramp, not even pausing to fire. Bolts from his companions hissed past. The clump of Dengarin's boots just meet his behind. A tech adept in the dark robes stepped out of the cab, gleaming pistol in hand. Dengarin fired past Olaki, one bolt ripping apart a head half made of metal and crystal. Olaki pushed into the confines of the cabin a moment later, grabbing the wrist of the second dark mechanicum priest as it swung a glittering knife. A split second an examination of the control console revealed it to be similar to those of a rhino or predator. Standard template construct rendered many systems instantly familiar. The dials were on idle, and the main ignition switch had not yet been activated. No! rasped the accolade as it guzzed Olaki's intent. Bolts sparked from the frame of the cab, and through the cracked window he saw the Sons of Horus veteran vault to the rail ramp. Just meters away. There has been too much... Olaki smashed his elbow into the Arab's face, snapping its neck and crushing the brain pan against the back of the cab. His other hand slammed to the magnetic switch, sending a flood of power surging through the engine. The machine shuddered, and the whine of secondary motors tore the air. Right in front of Olaki, the Sons of Horus veteran jumped into the broad his housing that contained the drill motor. Everything lurched sideways with a massive screech of breaking fiddlecrate and bulking metal. The drill tipped hard and left, pitching the son of Horus out of sight as Olaki crashed across the cab. He felt a sudden pull of gravity as the drill fell and masonry rained down with him. A flash of yellow armor and gray amongst the tumul of the drill stations collapse. Reflexes forged in a laboratory and honed in countless battles sent Thrag's hand towards the grill of the plummeting rig. Cetamite sheathed fingers, knifing through metal to close around the main strut of the drill motor casing. The rambling and crushing masonry drowned out the shouts of his companions and enemies, but the Vox was still over full of them. Instant and booming in his ear until they were not. Dozens of voices cut short in second. The rig hit a moment of slag and broke. The drill bit careening wildly down one slope, while the engine of the cab spun the other way. The rag pulled himself into the gap between motor housing and the serrated drill bit, armor locked as the mass spun over and over and over. One wrong collision would smash him against the titanium edge boring teeth slicing him apart, surer than his gene father's lightning claws. The housing sheared away on another hit. The void it found no longer existed, and he let go of the engine block, pushing himself away from the lethal cutting head. He fell another few meters before slamming hard into the sloped fear crate, thrumbling past a litter of tank-sized hulks of fallen masonry and broken armor. Metal shrieks slashed along his nerves as the drill bit came to rest a few score meters away. Lying motionless, looking up for a few brief seconds, Greg saw dim light about three hundred meters up, 
before shifting layers of debris formed a new ceiling where the darkness enveloped him. He knew immediately what happened. The drill station must have been built around the boring machine's last position rather than it being moved into the hall. Underneath had remained the tunnel dug by the machine. Such foundations that had been laid across it, weakened by time, and the heavy weapons fire of the brutal fight for the rig. The drill engine had been brought to full power. The vibration had been enough to break what had been left dropping the station into the maze of tunnels below. Somewhere there might be a way out, a passage or a mine shaft that led back to the high bottom, but it was just as likely that Thrag was completely cocooned in here. He heard the rattle of falling stones echoing from several directions at once. The last murmur of the engine faded the silence. There might be a way out. The drag had other plans. The cab was down here somewhere. That meant the Imperial Fist with the spider mark was too. He had been in the driver's cabin when the calamity had struck. The drag had seen him through the cracked window. Alive or dead, he was not far. Standing up, stiff inside his armor, Drag looked around. There was little light for even auto sensors to use. The terminal mode detected enough gleam from his right to indicate the heat of the engine. Though it was out of sight, they seemed to be in a series of linked chambers and caves. We were now sharing the same space be because of the roof cave-in. The best way to get anywhere would be to climb. The rubble would be highly unstable in places. Drag risked a flash of his suit lamp. A second of yellowish illumination dimmed by his auto senses so that he was not blinded. It gave him just enough to plot a course route from the slab he was just on to the first crest of the landship. Nearly blind, he groped his way forward until he had his hands of the broken masonry. Armor shifting, whirling softly round him. He started to climb. A skip in the visor chronometer warned Olaki that he had lost consciousness for just under twelve seconds. Electrical spacks across the instrument display highlighted in his immediate environment. He found himself wedged against the back of the driver's cabin, the engine block below him, the shattered remains of the front window above. The sticky mess all over his armor was presumably the tech adept that had been in there with him as they had rolled and bounced during the long drop. His warplate had fared better than most of the cab, which in places was buckled up around his ceramite like fitted cage. Malaki could free his left hand and pushed, bending the metal away, having praised himself some room to work. He looked for his bolter, but found nothing. With both hands, he was able to tear back the roof of the cab, giving himself a step from which he could push himself through. The frame of the front window into the jagged metal where the drill housing had originally connected to the main body. There was space above, and his suit detected a suitable atmosphere, which was well because Olaki became aware of the jabbing pain in his left side of his skull. But the helm had been broken, and a jagged sedamite had cut through the flesh into bone. Wincing, he tried to take off his helm, but it was stuck fast. With the fingers of his left hand, he twisted the shard of ceramite, feeling it biting into his head with every degree of turn. Sensing it loosen, he grabbed his helm in both hands and took a deep breath. Blood gushed from the wound as he ripped the helm free. A grunt of pain escaping pursed lips. Soon his body's superior clotting abilities staunched the flow and the pain disappeared in the flood of warplate administrated stims and boosted hormones. He pulled out the Vox system and hooked it over one ear. Two of the rig's external lumens were still working. Pale blue light stuttered across the irregular dome, about twenty meters high and thirty across. The bulk of the engine blocks were buried in rubble, 
but deeper shadow indicated a space where two girders had met, forming a rough arch. Orlaki lowered himself down, one hand pulling at his combat knife. It was belt as he ducked into the shadows. Beyond was a passageway, lined with cut stone, part of the underhive agriculture. He gave a subvocal command that activated the Vox pickup. Is anybody alive down here? He asked. This is Orlaki. Respond if you can. Any survivors? The Vox hissed for several seconds before a reply came. The voice that spoke was deep, the harshness of a Cthulian accent. Orlaki, it rasped, edged with cruel mirth. I'm still alive. Don't be impatient. I'll find you soon enough. Navigating across the broken landscape, Thrag found that his auto-senses were more interference than enhancement and slipped off his helm. He carefully placed it to one side, making no noise while he waited for his unassisted eyes to adjust to the gloom. Even then, he had only the barest idea of his surroundings. The darkness almost total. The air was thick with dust, clogging his nostrils as he took in a deep draught of air. As well as the powdered ferrocrate, he caught the smell of oil and refined promethium from the ruptured lines of the drill, the familiar rankness of his own thick sweat. Feeling the dust caking it on his hand, he rubbed at his face, using the cloud of to absorb the moisture, caking his skin in gray and brown. There's nothing he could do about the lubricant in his armor. But he figured his praise on warplate, and the background stench from the unbroken rig mask it. The same pulverized rock it coated is lively, masking it against the casual sight. Sound would be key. His auto senses could detect frequencies beyond normal human hearing. But Drag needed to hear as a hunter. Not filtered through a machine coated earpiece. Far too long he had stood in battle lines deafened to the roar of great guns and the cries of the dying. One of many. One of a legion. Now he was himself again. Alone against the foe, not part of a spearhead or rearguard, not the son of Horus or a legionary, but a creature of the dark and deep. The lessons from the War Master had not overridden the instincts honed down here. Thrag's world became a soundscape, each settling odour and scraping slab, taking its place in its impression of the surroundings. He moved with deliberate slowness, times almost immobile, as he settled armor boot onto loose gravel. Hands held up, body twisted perfect balance to transfer weight seamlessly from one foot to the other. When he climbed, he did so one limb at a time, each movement exaggerated, elbows and knees far from the stony slope to prevent any stretch or disturbance. What he could have bound up in seconds took minutes to traverse. Repressions was one of his greatest weapons. Focused entirely on the kill, he spared no thought for escape or evasion. Softly, softly, he breathed into the Vox pickup on the collar of his warplate. He hoped to spur the Imperial Fist into a mistake, distracting him at a vital moment, or forcing his patience. So far his goading had not been rewarded. Trap day, dawn scum. Looking for a way out. Nobody's coming. There's no aid. We're all dead. Gene Brothers. You are the last. And when I am done, I'll find my way out and kill more of your kin. His quarry doubtless drew strength from the idea of his companions was seeking him. The Imperial Fist would elude as best as he could. I find somewhere to lie now, till assistance reached him. Dreg 
took strength from his isolation. It was simply a confirmation of the Corthonian existence. The taunts of the traitor were infuriating, but they contained a truth that Orlaki had to confront. Even if there had were ever been survivors from the station collapse, they would be in no position to help. The lower levels into which they had fallen were effectively sealed, and the Vox signal had been poor enough to start with, so he faced a choice. Look for a way out, or resolve to confront his opponent. Olaki could feel the pain in his shoulder where the veteran's blade had pushed through to the muscle, and his body was starting to ache in dozens of places, even though the suppressants were wearing off. His warplate was like a second skin, but it did not make him immune to the effects of gravity and momentum. There was quite possibly internal damage from the main impact. There was certainly no obvious route out in the immediate surroundings of the rig. If Alaki were to set out, which direction would he take? He had a vague notion of where the drill part had fallen, but that was all. For all he knew, his foe was just meters away, around a heap of debris or lying in wait at the corner of his half-exposed corridor. Using a light would be too risky. Without the visor display of his helm, he could only have to rely on one direction, in position, sense, to keep an idea of where he was going. No starting reference point other than the rig, and those highly attuned sensors would be tested. He had to assume that staying close to the cab would make him easier to find. On the other hand, that also gave him a little insight to where his enemy might be, as it made for a natural objective to move towards. It was also the distinct possibility that the traitor was lying, pinned to the slab of rock crate by a station, unarmed and vulnerable, trying to bluff his way out of his predicament. Too many variables. Malaki decided he could not let the Vox taunts influence his analysis. He considered the issues he widened his search area, moving slowly in a spiral out form of the piling cabin, moving through ancient ductways and over collapsed floors from above. He stopped after a couple of minutes, sensing a coolness on his exposed cheek. Slowly turning one way and then the other, felt a trot coming from a haphazard pile of stones to his right. Bending to the rubble, he listened, catching the faintest jutter of a circulation and somewhere in the distance. As best as he could reckon, half a ton or more of masonry had fallen across the ventilation conduit. He could dig through in moments, or it would take minutes. He was certain that if it were the latter, his enemy would hear the noise and recognize what was happening. It was doubtfully dangerous because of his labors. Even if taken with care, it would absorb his attention, offering his opponent the chance to approach without detection. The risk had to be weighed against the potential advantage that come from breaking out of the dark, chaotic mess. Also, the slim but vulnerable potential of forging a route back to the Imperial Fist. Territories nearly half a kilometer above. Loki reached out a tentative hand to test how easily he could move the rubble. Dreg knew the silence on the Vox wasn't born of fear. The Imperial Fist was incapable, just as he was. Beneath the skin, amongst the gristle and the blood, the bionic chemicals, two of them were the same, engineered identically, but that was not but contained it was in the mind. The person, the experience that made a legionary. In that regard, Drag considered himself and the Dawn's son as different as orcs and Eldari. I killed my first enemy before there was any hair on my body, growled the son of Horus. I stalked them for half a cycle, staying close, but not too close. Waiting for the right moment, 
When he stopped, I stopped. When he ate, I ate. When he pissed, I pissed. I was a shadow. He never saw me. Blade, you see. Quick, silent, deadly. His gunmates never knew I was there until they found the corpse. Then I was already gone. Their shouts, my laughter. I still have his ear somewhere. That wasn't my training, you see. That was just life here in the dark beneath Lupercal's cage. He spoke quietly as he advanced in a crouch, ducking beneath a beam that had fallen across an old hallway. Drag knew he could not scare his foe, but he could still get into his head make him betray where he was, or spike his anger into a rash act that the son of Horus could exploit. You came to our world and thought you could be kings here. Despite his rising emotion, Drag kept his words quiet. You took our spire, our pride, our offspring. You deserve none of it. You haven't scratched your way up from the bedrock of this place. You haven't clawed and stabbed your way into the light from the dark below. You know nothing of what it means to rule as a Chthonian. The residual heat wash grew stronger in his thermal view, pulling him along the maze of half-tunnels and pile debris. Drag knew better than to approach directly to a possible ambush. Instead, he moved laterally, now and then to get a sense of distance and position. He thought he heard the occasional thud of stone on stone, perhaps just settling debris, but perhaps something else. You changed the name of our lord's place to Traitor's Gate, but see no irony in stealing our world, our youth for yourselves. It was he on terror that first broke the bond. He took our king and made us slaves with golden chains. Carthonia has already given up everything beneath the earth for mankind. All it has left is flesh to offer. But that is not enough. We have conquered hundreds of worlds. What have we earned for our descendants? Nothing! No fresh pastures beneath blue skies for the sons and daughters of Cothonia. No new mines from rich rock for them. Not even the memorial of a warrior's death. He on terror wanted us harsh and broken, desperate to escape his endless gloom. But he recognized not that from us being king would grow so strong of will. He had spied through the rough location of the engine from atop the first mound. Though there had been no direct route, just a trail of heat and a few scattered pieces of housing that led to a solid mass of fallen rubble. It was about thirty, forty meters from Derek, a little lower to his current position. We've clung on and fought for you for years refusing to die to submit. But you don't have the strength to do the same. This is not terror. This is not Inuit. What do you care, this dust and rock drained of all it's worth? A mission, a duty, a burden. You don't even want to be here. It is our home. That is why we will prevail. Drag could see a shallow dip in the piles of broken stones around it, signs of excavation. He moved in, readying for the kill. A slither of grains almost inaudible, warning Dreg of the danger. He threw himself aside as masonry cascaded towards him, leaping over half-buried section to skitter and slide down a troppled metal deck. Buckled and pitted from the age and collapse, he hit the drift of broken rubble bottom, and powdered into a run, choppy strides dodging left and right, accepting the roar of the bolter to sound out behind him at any second. 
Only when he had covered two dozen meters and thrown himself through a rusted metal grate into the access passage did he stumble into a stop and take stock. Glancing back through the opening, he heard the distant, distorted crunch of armored boots far above. The vox crackled next to his ear. You're mistaken, traitor, whispered the imperial fist. I'm exactly where to be. Bolaki cursed the loose footing that had betrayed him just seconds before the son of Horus had been in position. He knew well enough that the first strike he made would be the only one. The traitor veteran had disappeared somewhere to the south, but Orlaki was not sure how far. For the present, silence reigned again. Just the creak of settling debris and the wheeze of his armor broke the stillness. You are not special, told the son of Horus. This place is not special. I took my first breath on a world not so different to this one. I grew up among the layers of previous ages, my family scavenging a life out of the distress of the past generations. Escape was out of the question now. His opponent was too close. The chances of a second ambush were slim, but Oloki took some reassurance for the thought he had considered the same as his first attempt, but had come so close. Perhaps he had internalized the words from the son of Horus, his confidence eroded by broadcasting throw, he had believed he paid it no mind. That could work both ways. The Imperial Fist reckon their years by the Count on Terra. By that skill, I was six years old when I first pulled the trigger with deadly intent. A scrap thief who thought he could take our pitch on the Arcutech seam below the Elden Dome. Put a last bolt into the back of his head as he crept up on my mother with an auto pistol. Of a trophy, my father sold the body to the corpse grinders. We were able to survive a while longer. Oloki moved as he spoke, careful not to walk with rhythm that would be recognized as steps, sometimes taking two pieces in succession, then waiting a few seconds before taking another, always scanning his environment, straining every sense for the slightest hint of foe. He moved towards a faint scraping sound, taking bearings on the direction distance by moving a dozen meters to his left, and then back across his path to the right. Occasionally a rubble testified to the instability of the rubble mass, both above and below. I have never seen open sky or breathe fresh air, he told the traitor, realizing it was for the first time. When Dorn's legion took me from the Underhive, it was to a training facility in the Hive City, and from there to an orbiting fortress. And when I set foot upon the world's surface, it was beneath a city dome of glassite raised by the mechanicism, sheened with trigrams that obscured storm clouds of methane. I've got looked upon the stars, not even from the ship's ports or the heights of the traitor's gate. I was brought to these tunnels to hunt vermin. That is my purpose, you see. That was my first lesson, the most important lesson. Let no traitor live. I was made to hunt monsters, like you. The scratching and scraping was distant, the other noises. Insistent and repeated rather than random, a large wall had plunged from above and landed almost intact nearly ten meters high and several dozen meters long. The sound was coming from the other side. Dreg caught the scent of another legionary, lifting his head like a hunting cat. The smell of blood and oil was unmistakable and close. To his left was a long section of wall. The continuous sheet of Firocrate had fallen intact to split open a section of tunnels yet dividing the spread of rubble that had been created. Stopping heard scrapes on the stone and the soft wheeze of actuators or plate. He could see little, but what light there was from the gaps overhead showed him a relatively easy route down into the street created by the wall. He followed it with painstakingly care, 
measuring each tread, listening for any telltale thud of footfall or the whine of power armor at the full potential. Something moved about twenty meters ahead and Threg froze, eyes averted in case their whiteness caught the light and betrayed him. With slow practice, he raised a hand, first to waist height, then level with his rib, up to his shoulder, centimeter by centimeter, sliding it up to his brow, turned his head, finally to cover his eyes, but for a split second, between armored fingers, he waited, Ubel, and saw the movement again. It came with the sigh of artificial muscles, and he knew that his prey was at hand. He faced a choice. Stealth or speed. He judged the distance to his prey, who seemed to be crouched or set on the bank of debris, to be about thirteen or fourteen meters, too far for a rush attack, given that his opponent's reactions were as enhanced as his own. As deliberately as everything else he had done for the last hour, Drag moved forward, close to the wall, careful not to silhouette himself against the faint illumination. He covered the last seven meters in one leap, fist raised and blow. Never fell. Trapped in the rubble was an imperial fist, his legs and body crushed, pierced by rebar. Blood caked the side of his head from the cracked skull, and one eye was swollen shut with bruising. The son of dawn turned his head at the noise. Good eye wide with surprise, but he let out no sound. A hand fumbled at the rubble, and Dreg's eye was drawn to a bolt pistol just out of the legionary's reach. Dreg stopped, stooped, down, taking his time so that he made no more noise now than before, fingers moving for the pistol. Shout for him, he whispered, so gently the words barely carried to the stricken space marine. Shout for your brother. The reg's fingers tapped across the metal of the bolt pistol, questing for the grip. His eyes fixed on the imperial fist staring at him. There was still defiance there. He did not betray himself and his legion brother. A Primarch would be proud. The reg breathed, fingers of his free hand clamping into the space marine's throat, pushing against the windpipe. The other fingers curled around the pistol. Just at that, that moment, the son of Horus saw something, the imperial fist eye. Not an expression, but a sudden darkness. The shadow of something atop the wall behind Dreg. The moment he had pulled himself up onto the wall, Orlaki had seen Sergeant Tankard smashed against the distress of the collapsed station. His first instinct had been to see if he could aid the squad leader, but a more ruthless, practical voice had stopped him before he had dropped down. Instead, he had lain atop the wall for eighteen minutes, ears blocking the sound from Tankard in an attempt to pick out the approach of his enemy. The son of Horus would hear Tankard feeble struggle sooner or later, and it was better to know the area of content than to continue blindly paw through the rubble of the oh. Eighteen minutes of watching Tankard grow weaker and weaker, blood bubbling from his mouth like black sludge in the dim light. For the last seven minutes, patience had been rewarded by the slow creep of his enemy. Drowned to the movement of Tankard like a spider web. Except it was Orlaki that was the waiting predator. Now and then he lost the vague outline of the veteran, and his heart raced a little faster, till he appeared again almost invisible against the firocrate and the fractured rockrate, bent steel. Malaki picked his movement, easing himself back into a crouch before finally dropping down onto his prey. The veteran spun faster than even a legionary's reaction allowed. He had Tanker's pistol in hand. Malaki was committed, combat knife plunging towards the neck of the son of Horus. The Imperial Fist thrust a hout a hand to grab his opponent's wrist as the pistol muzzle swung towards his face. Likewise, the veteran's fingers closed around Orlaki's arm, the knife point centimeters from exposed skin. The two braced like that, arms locked against each other, teeth gritted with strain and transhuman muscles straining against each other. There was delight in the eyes of his enemy. What was your name? 
Blocky asked. I feel I know you so well, but not your name. Kizila Drag. That's the name of your killer, spat the son of Horus. His hand twisted, edging the bolt pistol around a few degrees more. The shot would now graze the side of Loki's head. You're nothing. An absurpa! Yes. Without you, nothing, Loki admitted. He adjusted his weight a fraction, pushing the knife a centimeter closer to his target. Killing traitors gives me purpose. It is enough. The ground shuddered beneath them, but neither legionary allowed the slightest flicks in their grip. Dreg stared hard into the eyes of the Imperial Fist. The face looked young, but there was depth in the other's gaze he had not expected. He could not have been a legionary for more than a few years, but Dreg could feel the hate emanating from Orlaki, as though he had fought a lifetime. What had they been put into his mind for such hate to prosper? The floor shifted again. Rebels slipped down the slope. Trapped Imperial Fist groaned as stones and girders shifted. Plaster cracked along the wall behind him. The expressions of both warriors changed subtly, each reacting to the predicament. There was no weakness or relent in either of them. Orlaki sneered and pushed harder, getting the knife another half a centimeter closer to Drag's throat. But the veteran son of Horus had recognized the intent and gained his own advantage, slipping his foot back a little to give him more leverage on the pistol side. He employed that to turn the muzzle a little more, Cinnamite creaking in the grip of his foe. For all that, the changes were inscrutably small, and both combatants could have been cast from plasteel. Gravel pattered like rain and the fresh dust cloud descended from the unstable roof. A chunk the size of Drag's head crushed to the ground just to his right, larger pieces grinding the scraping above. Only in death does duty end, said Rolaki. Drag smiled grimly. To the last man. To the last blood. To the last breath. I'm tired. Sleep eludes me. Anyways, there's a few things I want to bring up for uh, the YouTube channel itself. There are three different projects I am currently working on behind the scenes. That is one of the few reasons why... I have not been posting a lot of videos. The second one is I have been working longer shifts, so I am more dead than usual. <clears throat> one of them is going to be a prequel to the Horus Heresy, where I am going through the different battles the Imperial Fist have gone through, and in one way or another trying to recreate them into what would be known as um, Rogue One-ish. In the Star Wars series, where they said Barton Dies died for this mission into a full-fledged movie. I'm going to be attempting to do that with my own spin, since I've been reading audiobooks and um, books from Warhammer and all that, and I love narratives more than anything else for the tabletop. I'll be playing them out with assistance of an AI and other people. So that way, if things don't go a specific way, I can figure out a way to maneuver them to fit more into the actual lore. I'll be using my in-game system, which is somewhat close to lore accurate and is, from what I can tell, even. Like, it's fair for both sides to play. Which is rare for Warhammer, but I did it somehow. I did it. Hooray. Uh, the second project, which is taking up a lot of my drawing time, is something uh, very experimental. But, if it works out, it will be the most fun thing I would ever put onto this YouTube channel. Uh, here's a hint. Have you ever 
in the past read a book that is a choose your own adventure cool well then that, that that's all you're gonna get that's all you're gonna get for now and the last and final thing that I am working on and these are all my my own personal projects that I want to put onto the channel the last one is um, a music uh, just music in general like metal metal music synth metal like dark synth music for uh, specific chapters that I like and uh, armies for Warhammer it's not gonna be you know, it's it's not gonna straight out be. Oh, this is the Imperial Fist song. This is uh, Sons of the Wall. I think I've talked about that in the past, but I'm just bringing it up again just to throw it out into the wind, and to remind myself I need to start working on it. <clears throat> Anyways, let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. Let us say thank you to Caesar E. Lopez, Jamin Davidson, Ricky Brown, Matas, Josh Sickles, Azuth eighty nine. Thompson 235, Starboard, Lilac, NPC, Ken S, Mike H, Fortis Unam, Eldrick Madred, and Keller Z. And Kokoa. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon support member of the channel, you can too in the link in the description down below in any of my videos. Uh, on there, you'll see snippets of things that are currently being worked on, such as behind the scenes for the new projects I'm working on. So if you want to hear some jarbled up music ideas or read the lyrics ahead of time, maybe see art, uh, a library that is soon to be uh, emptied, because uh, I'm going to start reading a lot more. Or try to. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that's that, that's about it. Alright. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this video. And the little blah, 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 blah that I had in a few of the moments while reading. Because um, I was trying to read as fast as I could. Because I kept seeing comments in most or all my YouTube channel videos of... Uh, I had to put it in three times speed to listen to this properly. Thank you. And a lot more people saying read faster. So I tried my best with this one. So hopefully this is to your liking of speed. I don't know why you want to listen to someone read Warhammer like a chipmunk. But um, uh, whatever floats your boat, I guess. I don't get it, but I don't know. I have a long attention span. I mean, I can read these books chapter by chapter and not get bored. I can play Warhammer. I could paint for hours. I don't get it. Maybe it's more than just an attention span thing. It's something else. I don't know. Maybe it's just personal preference. Whatever it is. Let me know in the comment section down below. And, as always, what would you like for me to read next? I'm open to, suggest uh, I'm open to suggestions. There, there we go. See, I did a little bleh. <laughs> All right. That's enough out of me. You've been you. I've been me. Thank you for watching another one of these videos. And finally... Kyphus Kane is around the corner. I'll see you then. Stay safe out there and have yourselves a good one. Good morning, good afternoon, or good night. Whatever time period you're listening to this. Hopefully you have a good whatever is going on. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.